So I, I recently moved from uh, Trinity College in Dublin to Bristol University, but more importantly, I moved from a mathematics department to a computer science one, and that's led me to reflect on the role of uh, computers in my um, uh, personal development, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, Philip Larkin said uh, uh, sexual intercourse began in 1963 between the end of the Chatterley Ban and the Beatles' first LP. Uh, so that was old hat when I first heard about it, but home computing, home computing began in 1983. Uh, so I was there to see it begin, and, and here I wanted to share some nostalgia for that golden age. The first computer I saw wasn't a home computer, it was a VAX, a mainframe. We had a digital, uh, we had a digital factory in uh, Galway, where I'm from, and we were brought on a school tour to see this thing. Uh, the, the operative loaded a, a big magnetic reel into a cabinet-like part of the machine, typed, and this is what came out. <laughs> now, uh, unfortunately, we had no idea who Peanuts was, so we were uh, mystified and, and uh, culturally embarrassed, but technologically <laughs> excited, a kind of theme for my life. Um, however, what we didn't know was, was that that wasn't the future, that was the past. Th this is Jack Tremble, uh, an amazing man. He was a Holocaust survivor who got his start repairing uh, typewriters and went on to start uh, Commodore computers. He said, computers for the masses, not for the classes. And to that end, he followed uh, his company's successful a Commodore Pet small business machine with the VIC-20. Part of the first generation, along with the Acorn and ZX80, of genuinely affordable home computers. It was sold in, in shops, in mail order. In 1982, it sold uh, 800,000 units. I got one in, in 1983. This is what it looked like. Uh, you, you attached it to your TV. Uh, you tuned your TV to the signal from the computer. You stored files on an audio cassette, and it made this noise, which you'll all remember. <laughs> if you're a certain age. <laughs> and this is what you saw when you switched it on. See the terrible resolution. See the, the minuscule 3K uh, RAM. See the 8-bit everything. But see, too, the invitation to program. This is what it gave you, a command line. And here's some uh, Commodore Basic. Every line had a, had a number. You wrote go to all the time. It said ready, but if you press return past the ready, it gave you an error. It was infuriating. There was, uh, there was no small letters. If you press shift on a, on a letter key, you got these uh, funny glyphs called uh, pet graphics. Even more exciting was Poke. Poke allowed you to change any part of the system memory. Here it's been used to change the screen color, but you could also, for example, change the shape of the letters. It was even rumored there was a killer Poke which would overclock the chip and set the whole machine on fire. We, <laughs> we never found it. Perhaps. This is me and my friend Kieran Coughlin uh, using the VIC-20. So what was it we did in those uh, long days of late childhood as the sun tracked across the sky and my mother kept telling us to go outside and get some fresh air? Well, we did the thing that the VIC-20 invites you to do. We learned how to program. Not very well, but we learned how to program. We wrote a program to write fictitious but grammatically correct sentences about the life we thought we'd be leading if we weren't inside programming. We wrote a big number calculator that uh, never really worked. Uh, we wrote a program that produced random five-letter uh, words and would have stopped it ever, if it ever reached my name. But it never did, showing us the immensity of the information universe and causing an existential chill which never quite went away. <laughs> We tried to write an adventure game, but of course we quickly ran out of, uh, ran out of memory. But the thing was, silly though these programs were, it was enough. It was enough to show us this third realm, this beautiful world of computing, which is different from the everyday world we already knew, and different from the world of sexual intercourse, which at that time we were just discovering in a completely theoretical way. <laughs> it was enough to uh, show us the, the essential joy of, of, of the feeling of manipulating programs and logic in your head. It was enough to show us that... Uh, uh, that beautiful world uh, that's both internal and platonic, the, the realm of logic. It's like swimming. There's always a moment when you're swimming when you feel that you're a water creature. It only lasts a second because then you have to breathe. <laughs> but afterwards, you're, you're, you're not just a person. You're a person who knows what it was like uh, to be at one with the water, and that makes your heart grow. And here is the machine that killed the golden age. These things started sprouting on, on kitchen tables and, and desks everywhere. It was a wonderful thing. It allowed you to word process and to use paint, but it didn't invite you to program. In fact, it kind of locked all of that away. It was like uh, Apple said, yes, I know your wardrobe has a door to Narnia, but you should use our wardrobe instead. There's no Narnia, but, you know, it, uh, it contains more clothes and it allows you to arrange them more neatly. <laughs> and then later on they explained that if you used the wardrobe, they were allowed to sniff your underwear. But, um, <laughs> but fear not. The, uh, the world of programming still exists. Uh, fairies still dance in our streets. This is another golden age. Laptops are, are cheap and affordable. Uh, compilers are free. There's Raspberry Pis. So my basic message is, <coughs> my basic message is that you should live this nostalgia. You should uh, install Linux. You should use a command line. You should buy a Raspberry Pi. And most importantly, you should teach your children to program. Or if you don't have any children, you should teach somebody else's. But the main thing is, teach kids to program like it's 1983.
It's a beautiful thing. Thank you.